this webinar of the Jerusalem Press Club with M.K. Mirav Mikhaeli of the Labour Party. I want to thank Gal Bejerano, the spokesman of uh, M.K. Mikhaeli, and my colleagues at JPC for facilitating this webinar. Uh, Ms. Mikhaeli will start with a short introduction and then we'll open up for Q&A. You are on mute, so please type your questions on chat and she will answer them, or I'll read them and she'll answer them. You will uh, read them, that's a very good idea. Okay. Uh, Mera Mikhaeli uh, is a form. It's very nice to meet you. Thank you for having me on this webinar. It's a... Um, it's, um, it's a first, I think, that I specifically am doing this. So it's, right, it's, right. And Merav, sure I wanted to say, Merav, I wanted to say a few words about you, uh, if you allow me, okay? So Merav Mikhail is a former senior journalist in radio and print, has been a member of the Knesset since January 2013, promoting issues of society and economy, gender equality, religion and state, minority rights, and being a strong feminist for the last 20 years, she's been seeking to promote women and equal rights for women. So, Merab uh, Mikhaili, please. Thank you very much. Um, I would just like to add that I was also for my first six years in the Knesset Defense, uh, Foreign, Foreign Affairs and Defense Committee. It was one of the most important things to me when I uh, was elected to not neg neglect these issues to the boys only. Um, one of the main things I believe in is security through peace. Um, you know, peace for me is one of the major feminist causes and um, achievements to be. So this is also, um, I think, w actually there's um, a saying in my office that the one thing that we don't um, do is tourism. The rest is something that we see as our responsibility. Um, I'm, I have been, as, as Uri mentioned, I had a career on the media for many, many years. But for most of it, I had a parallel career in feminism because for me, this is all feminism. And I started in 95 by um, actually doing the first ever uh, public feminist campaign. It was uh, designated to change the public concept about sexual assault and sexual harassment. Back in 95, it was something that was completely taboo in Israel. Um, thankfully, we've managed to change this reality completely. We have sad achievements such as a former president jailed for sexual assault, a former um, minister of defense and a former minister of uh, security, not, not jailed but convicted for sexual assault and etc. It's been constantly on the agenda ever since. And it really led to many other feminist achievements in our public sphere. Unfortunately, the um, government system did not adapt to the reality that the public has completely taken in and internalized. So we still have our work cut out for us. Um, so I would say that my coming into politics was kind of natural because I was dealing with most of the issues that Uri um, that mentioned through organizations, working with um, NGOs, working through pushing from the outside, lobbying and pushing legislation, bringing budgets, helping to connect other celebrities and rich people to the causes that I've been working for. So it was for me continuing to do the same thing only in a new platform. And thankfully, uh, even though I've only been in the opposition since then, I've managed to um, legislate 20 um, laws that are that I, I single-handedly promoted and another, uh, I don't know, a number of dozens more that I was um, a part of and also had really the privilege of being able to move big, big uh, changes in Israeli um, 
reality. But as I said, I had to settle for doing this from the opposition so far. So the main goal still remains to rebuild Israeli center left and to create a political body, a functioning political body in the center left that can take over the government of Israel and really design its reality according to the identity it was created um, for. So coming up. Which, which brings us to the question uh, we were uh, gathered to discuss, and that is your uh, party is joining the government. This is what you wanted, no? Okay, so you're finding me in the midst of a huge fight I'm conducting these days to prevent my party from joining this um, very bad, 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 dangerous government that is being formed these days. Um, we are only three uh, faction members, only three mandates in the Knesset, two of which um, the chair and my other colleague have decided to join the government. But given that Labour still is a democratic party, it requires the approval of the conference or the how would central you committee, it? central committee, committee, something like that. It's a rather big forum, and it will have to take placed digitally this time. So we've started working on convincing a majority, we hope, to vote against it. I truly believe that it doesn't matter if you look at it from the moral side, the political side, the practical side, not only is there no justification to join this, as I said, dangerous government, but also there's a huge opportunity to rebuild a, um, an ideological and political alternative in the situation that was created, given that um, blue and white that was for a second there was uh, seemingly an alternative broke and um, is, is practically not, ex doesn't exist anymore. There's a huge vacuum. There are more than a million people who voted in the hope and the yearning to replace Netanyahu and now have no one who represents them. And it's up to us to be the party that represents them and really fights for their rights, for Israel, for our future. So as I said, you caught me in the war room for this fight. Yeah, but, but don't you agree that uh, the coronavirus uh, uh, crisis comes before these kind of uh, considerations? Completely. And that's why we cannot allow the coronavirus to be used as an excuse to wipe out Israeli democracy. Because in the What's happening now is that Netanyahu has been using this sense of emergency, and some of it is genuine emergency situation, in order to shut down the courts completely, in order to allow the secret service to follow Israeli citizens. We are the only country, to my best knowledge, that uses the coronavirus crisis to allow the secret service to follow, um, to conduct surve uh, surveillance after citizens. Um, there was also an attempt to stop the parliament from working, practically to stop any kind of inspection or control over what the government does. And now um, we're seeing what's happening in this negotiation. What we're seeing is um, Netanyahu getting a veto on any um, nomination and any appointment of any senior person in the justice department, in the justice system for someone who stands trial for corruption, how can you possibly give him veto over judges, over the attorney general, over um, the chief uh, of the police? This is so, so dangerous. So certainly the coronavirus comes first, but it's not dealt, um, it's not dealt on its own. It's dealt with, with Netanyahu's good in mind. I mean, look at the um, economical 
compensation that he promises Israeli citizens. It's, I don't know, like 10th of what other countries are giving to their citizens. So all of this should be handled and taken care of, but not by Netanyahu and certainly not by joining him. So you're sticking to the just not Netanyahu issue while Kahol Lavan uh, really dropped that. And you know, you mentioned them uh, and, and you, surely you realize that the uh, majority of Israeli support the move of, of Kahol Lavan to the government and even many of their own supporters uh, endorse it. So maybe you are detached from what the Israelis want. Not a majority of the uh, blue and white um, voters. No, I, I didn't say majority. I, sa I said many. I Not the majority. Uh, yeah, well, because, you know, people are afraid now, um, not only from the virus, but I think first and foremost for their financial situation. This is very frightening. I can totally see that. And I'm not saying we should have gone to elections right away. We certainly could have given the government what is referred to as a kind of safety net. And we could have postponed uh, the elections like they did, for instance, in the Yom Kippur War in 73. There are solutions. So certainly we, sh we can't and we should never have dragged the country to another round of elections right now. But we also don't have to give in to all the dangerous things that Netanyahu is doing to Israel and to its citizens in the name of the coronavirus emergency. Moreover, Blue and white already entered the government. There's already a government. Why should labor join as this tiny thing or the tail of blue and white? The, the, what is it exactly? And Amir Peretz is not even conducting his negotiations with, um, with Bibi Netanyahu. He's conducting it with Benny Gantz. He's um, mortgaging the party to Benny Gantz. How come? I mean, please. But you've been uh, supporting him for a long time. You've been his ally. Uh, do you feel betrayed? I'm sorry, now? can you repeat? You, you've been no, uh, uh, Amir. You. Uh, you, you've been Amir Peretz's uh, ally for a long time. Do you feel betrayed right now? No, it's not about that. It's nothing personal. I, was, I supported Amir for a long time, you're right, because I believed in him as a leader, because I, draw, because I um, subscribe to most of the things that he believes in and stands for. I believe he's an important leader. I, I think he brought to the Israeli public discourse important issues and fought for them. So, and I, that's why I was supporting him for all this time. But now that he's about to give it all up and give in to the right, to the extreme right wing, to their extreme policies, Israel, to its mere existence these days, I can't possibly support that. Why don't you uh, take a look at it out of the box? You got three mandates from the Israeli public, and soon you can get two ministries, two ministries for three Knesset members. Isn't that what politics is about? Well, it, I don't know, not for me. For me, politics is just a mean to design reality, to create the world you think should exist the world I want to live in, not to be a minister that gets to play. It's, it's, like a, it's like playing in a sandbox because when Netanyahu is the one dictating the policy, he's the one, he's already announced what his financial program to um, the post coronavirus uh, crisis is. So how much do you think you can affect the economy, even if you are the economy mi is, uh, minister, when Netanyahu already set the rules and already decided on the sums and 
I mean, this is, it's just ridiculous, seriously. Now, moreover, um, Uri, you should know, and I don't know if our colleagues are following, I mean, our colleagues in, in this um, meeting are following Israeli politics so closely, but so many people have tried that. I mean, in, 19, in 2009, we had um, Ehud Barak, coming into the government under Netanyahu. And then in 2012, we had Shaul Mufaz. And then in 2013, we had Tzipi Livni. And in 2015, we had Kahlon. So each and every one of them had the best intentions in mind. And all of them were convinced that they can influence from within and that they can be the checks and balances of Netanyahu. And where are all of them out of politics? And where is Netanyahu stronger than ever? So why give Netanyahu the pleasure of, I mean, to me, seriously, this is the man who's the incitement from his inspiration, I would say, okay, led to the killing of Itzhak Rabin, the late uh, assassinated prime minister from Labour. I don't think he should get to kill the party as well now. What do uh, supporters, there's a question from one of the participants, what do supporters of the party tell you? I mean, do, do they support you or Amir Peretz, or you don't know? Well, of course, some of them support joining the government. I'm not saying that there aren't any people who support joining the government, but I'm telling you, I've been in politics for seven years, such a turnout of people voluntarily has never um, happened to me before. It's like thousands of people through my personal um, cell phone, through WhatsApp, through um, all of my networks, the social networks, and even people um, on the street come up to me and say, thank you, thank you, thank you for fighting over this. And we are with you and this should never, I mean, this cannot happen let's prevent it from happening there is i mean think about it for the third time in a year there was a majority in israel for replacing netanyahu and his government and for the third time people are disappointed but actually now they're heartbroken because really people voted for Gantz and blue and white not because they believed in anything they stood for because they didn't stand up for anything other than replacing Netanyahu. And in that sense, you said I was sticking to the not only not Netanyahu, uh, just not Netanyahu, um, but it's not about that at all. I have nothing personal with Netanyahu. I'm not really, it's not about him. It's about his deeds and the outcomes of his, of his deeds. It's really very dangerous. I know that democracy is very vague. It's hard to follow and to feel in your private lives the uh, deterrence or, and, and I would say, the er erosion that is happening in Israeli democracy. But it, the day will come when we do feel it in our day-to-day -day lives. And I don't want to get to this day. I want to stop this process before that. Right. And I don't want to get to this day where they annex the West Bank and then we have to deal with the question, do we give or don't we give citizenship to the Palestinians there? I want to stop it before that. So it's, it really is dire. I mean, it's not political games at all. It is life itself. Okay, I'm joining two questions together. One is, uh, why, why did Labour fare so badly in the last few elections, uh, first of all, and, and a harsh question, which to me is even more harsher because my parents turn in their grave when they hear about the Labour Party today. Is this the end of the Labour Party? Well, I'll start with the first question because it, it leads to the second one. Uh, there are many, many reasons to why uh, labor got to its very, very um, critic situation right now. Um, many PhDs can be written about the way that labor did um, ever since, ever since. But I think I'll stick 
to what I believe to be the main explanation. And I think that the, assess the, the incitement against Yitzhak Rabin and against Oslo that resulted uh, in his assassination. And the fact that Netanyahu succeeded in winning the elections afterwards really crushed the center left um, camp in Israel. Um, and, and understandably so, because the, the violence, first of all, succeeded. It succeeded both physically in really killing Yitzhak Rabin and also politically. And so I think the center left camp in Israel is a lot like a, a um, victim of violence. And those of us who know um, violence and what it does, you know it creates an overwhelming chilling effect. And it, is, it makes it very, very difficult for the victim to, rec to really rehabilitate. Now, add that to poor decisions, to incompetence sometimes, to many other things, and that's... Can't you, can't you add, can't you add, can't you add also, and this is a question from one of the journalists, uh, the Palestinian terrorism, which moved people to the right? Well, you know, Palestinian terrorism, like any other fact, is something that you can relate to at least in two ways. I mean, uh, generally speaking, Palestinian terror in Israel is something that causes um, leftists to say, you see, we need peace, and right-wingers to say, you see, there's no one to talk to. So it's it's not about the thing itself. And the, the uh, peace process or negotiations with the Palestinians or the conflict, it, again, it too can um, certainly supply uh, material for a number of PhDs, um, if not more than that, and already has, I think, a full library on it. But again, it's it's about political will, and the problem is that the political will... I have to caution you that uh, we're here. getting uh, uh, alerts all the time that uh, the internet on your side is, is not so stable, but uh, we'll do the best I as we can. Now. What, what I said was that it's, at the end, it's, it's down to political will. And the political will in the center left was broken in the last decades. And also, and I think, and also, and, also you, you are probably a suicidal party because it's like a Irish firing squad which stands in the circle. You, you kill your leaders every time. You had Shelley Achimo, you had Herzog, you had the... Uh, uh, I, I can't even f remember uh, all of them. Abi Gabay, uh, and now it's Paris. It's a symptom. It's not the thing. But, um, my connection is unstable. It lets me know. Let me try something here. Um, you, of course, what you mentioned is a symptom. It's not the problem itself. It's one of the symptoms right. for the problematic situation that right. the center left camp uh, is in and labor as what used to be the leader of this camp is. But what I believe strongly is that we are now in a point that it's so low on one hand and there's sort of nothing to lose already and then on the other hand, there's this huge opportunity of this huge vacuum of a million voters who are now left without an address, without leadership. And it's up to labor. It's our responsibility to build back this leadership because the people are out there and the majority of Israelis, and this is the most important thing maybe to, to stress, the majority of Israelis, when you speak to them about the issues themselves, not the headlines and not the images, but the issues themselves, people support our ideology. People want a welfare state that takes care of its citizens economically and financially and with social services, strong and like communal for social services. People want a democratic state. Yes, they want equal rights for citizens of all sorts, generally speaking, that is. 
And even a majority, even though it's a smaller majority, but still a majority that believes in the two-state solution and in security through peace. So it's up to us to be able to communicate this with a strong enough self-esteem um, and self-confidence um, to be able to make labor the next alternative once again. Do you think it was a mistake to run with the Meretz and Oli Levy, or one of them? Well, for about Meretz, in the last uh, round, really we came into, uh, we got into this point where we had no, other, no alternative because there was such huge pressure and such fear that one of the parties um, and Meretz would, may not uh, pass the threshold that there was really no choice left. I did not support it. I thought we should um, maintain uh, labor as big as possible, even though it was already very small, but not as small as it is now. But this is all water under the bridge. Uh, and it was all done when blue and white were the big party anyways. So, but now this is all gone. There's no blue and white anymore. I mean, one part, the, one, the part that went with Netanyahu is already history. And the other part is Yayo Lapid and Bogi Alon. They're not center left, they're center right. And they, they state so. So the coast is clear. We just need to get up on our feet and do the right thing. Uh, last question. Um, what happens if you fail in your attempt to block this movement into government? We, we will face a unprecedented situation in which well, your party is in the government, but you are against it, or how, how it's going to work? It's not unprecedented at all. Amir Peretz himself was in this position when uh, he was a part of the Barak coalition with Netanyahu. And so it was not only him, but also um, min, uh, former members of Knesset, Yuli Tamir, and Shelly Yechimovich, and others who voted against the government. They were formally part of the coalition because they were part of labor, but they, they called it, they were, they called themselves the composition. So I would be a composition of one. Um, and, but I, I truly believe that there's a good chance that I, that I can avoid this situation. So for what it's worth, if we have any listeners who are um, um, members of labor and mem members of the center of labor, please bring it to their attention that it's up to them to avoid um, this horrible situation that I hope we don't get to. Member of the Knesset, Meram Mikhaili, thank you very much. I'm sure you are made of the right stuff. You have the passion and the ideology. I hope there's enough people to support you out there. Thank you very much for joining us. And thank you, so do I. Uh, everybody. Thank you very much. Stay tuned to our next things.